Hello, and welcome to the second video in the Princeton Festival's lecture series on Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart's The Nazi Die Figaro. In this video, we're going to delve a little bit into the wonderful characters that make this opera come alive for us on stage. It's part of the great beauty of and skill of Mozart's writing that even the minor characters in this opera have their moments to shine. It's a very egalitarian opera in that sense. Lots of characters get arias, lots of characters get important roles in the plot, such that even characters like the oily Basilio in Act One really come to life on stage and immediately tell us something about the type of character that they are and how we as the audience should receive them. Now, unfortunately, the characters are so wonderful that you could go through each of them and spend an entire lecture just getting into how their character works and what their music is about. So in this lecture, we're just going to focus on two of them. We'll look at the servant Figaro, and we're going to then look at the lonely Countess Almaviva. We're going to do so primarily through two of their arias. In fact, the initial arias for each character. So come on. Before we get into the respective arias of Figaro and the Countess, let's first locate them among the cast of characters. Now, anyone attending the opera buffa of Mozart's Vienna, and indeed those who go to an opera buffa today, should not be expecting to see anyone like gods and goddesses or the great heroes of myth in the plots of these operas. Indeed, they went to see some sort of caricatured reflection of their own societal divisions. Now, in that, uh, in that time, we're going to see, therefore, characters that fall into three distinct classes. They're very clearly delineated in how they're introduced in the opera. And again, for Mozart's Vienna, uh, these would have been ossified characterizations that then would have allowed them to very quickly appreciate the interaction between these classes. So Figaro, as we've discussed, belongs to the servant class. This is the bottom of the totem pole. These are the figures who uh, possess no real social or political power in, uh, the rea in the real world. So in the world of opera, we gain a lot of aesthetic pleasure from watching these uh, adroit servants outwit and manipulate the ruling classes. Figaro is among the most prominent ex examples. We also see Susanna, who is able to traverse the different social classes, but does so in a way that's a little less antagonistic than Figaro in her friendship with the Countess. We then also have some more strictly servant buffo characters. We have the drunk gardener, Antonio, who is a bit character uh, used for humorous effect. He has a role to play in the Count's attempt to catch Figaro in a lie in the second act. We have Martellina, who we've discussed has, uh, it is eventually revealed to be Figaro's mother and is, again, a strictly buffa character in that sense. And then we also have Antonio's daughter, daughter Barbarina, she was uh, performed by a 12-year-old singer at the premiere of the opera, which is not something you see often today, and over the course of the opera is revealed to be uh, Carabino's main love interest. Turning to the top of the totem pole then, we have the noble class. We have first uh, Count Almaviva, the, the count whose uh, actions bring to light so many of the tensions in this opera. In reality, this aristocratic figure, the head of the house, would have possessed much of the political and social power. What he said went. And so questioning the Lord's decision-making capacity was a surefire way to get into a lot of trouble. You had to ask his permission to leave, uh, and you served at his behest and at his whim. And so if you have someone who is inept in that position or who is not fit to serve, uh, tensions can arise. And in the case of Opera Buffa, that is where a lot of the humor comes from. Then we have his wife, who we'll discuss in more detail, the Countess Almaviva. She is someone who, again, is uh, now that she is married, has very little recourse outside of the traditional, uh, traditional societal role of dutiful wife. Although she is unhappy, she is not able to file for divorce, let's say she really is sort of stuck with Count Amaviva and thus must commit to making that marriage work. And then rounding out that cast of nobles, we do have the young page uh, Cherubino, who some critics or philosophers have suggested is in fact a young Don Giovanni, someone who is obsessed with love 
and has yet to reach the point where that obsession with love crosses the boundary into threatening women. Be that as it may, we then have a final class, an intermediary class of professionals. These are people who are fodder for the composer and librettist wit. They are often caricatured and they are mined for their humorous content. So we have Don Basilio, a music master. You can see Mozart having fun with this characterization, uh, this sort of stereotypical figure in the music scene and the uh, uh, elite scene of Vienna. You have Dr. Bartolo, also a lawyer. He is someone who is possessed with ineffectual rage. He uh, sings a stereotype, a stereotypical rage aria that we might see in a genre such as opera seria or serious opera, but because he is a buffo character, that rage is rendered uh, buffoonish and ultimately as, as though a windbag. It is not effective in any means whatsoever. Very bombastic, but with no real substance. Uh, all to the credit of this doctor as a character. And finally, rounding out that group is Don Curzio, the stuttering, stammering judge, someone who is supposed to be the word of the law and yet cannot complete a sentence without stumbling over his, his words. Now, Figaro will get into his opening aria now, but we should mention first that the tensions that arise out of this division into different social classes are those that uh, center on the uh, abilities of the characters in a given class. So if someone is inept, but they were born a noble, well, you're still stuck with them as a noble. And that was a situation in Mozart's time period in the late 1700s, this revolutionary period, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, was becoming increasingly untenable for various constituencies of Europe. And that is largely what Beaumarchais' uh, play revolves around. It, it is a social critique that calls to light some of the issues that lower classes have with the conduct of the nobility. And indeed, the language that Beaumarchais uses is sometimes quite pointed, calling out the nobility. As he writes uh, for Figaro, towards the end of that play, Figaro is speaking to the Count, no, Master Count, you will not have her, that is Susanna. You will not have her. Because you are a great lord, you think you have a great nature. Nobility, fortune, rank, position, all that makes you so proud. What have you done to gain so many advantages? You took the trouble to be born and nothing else, otherwise a rather ordinary man. And so we see Figaro feeling particularly uh, pressed upon in this passage. And he's pointing out to the Count that he, Figaro, has always had to get by on his wits and his intelligence. He was not born into wealth. He was not born into power, as the Count was. Now, this is actually a rather insulting pas uh, passage, as the whole construction of the nobility is this idea that they are uh, an extraordinary sort of person. And to have someone from the lowest of classes point out to you that, in fact, you are a rather ordinary person, is not something that the nobility in real life Europe would have been expected to stand. And therefore you can read into the passage in a piece of art and find humor in that. Now, as I mentioned in the last lecture, this particular version of the play did not make it to the stages of Vienna. The German language version of the play was vetoed by Emperor Joseph II before it saw the light of day. But the opera was able to premiere as scheduled. And so, how did Mozart and De Ponte go about working some of these themes in without really making them come across as pointedly as they do in this passage uh, from the Beaumarchais? So in order to discuss that issue, we're going to deal with Figaro's first aria. It is an aria that, uh, a small cavatina, not even quite a full aria, that occurs at the beginning of Act One. So in this passage, Figaro has just discovered, basically from Susanna, of the Count's plan. The Count has placed their, their uh, nuptial bedroom close to his own chambers. Figaro, thinking this was a mark of esteem, is very happy about this, but he finds out from Susanna, indeed, that the Count is planning on using this proximity as a means to access Susanna without Figaro knowing. So in this aria, Figaro now, hip to the Count's sort of uh, ploys and plans, is letting the Count know that if this is the game you want to play, I'm willing to play it. Now, the way that he expresses his willingness to play is very interesting from the perspective of social dance. But for now, just listen to it. It's an aria that unfolds in two parts. 
and we'll listen to it first and then talk about what makes it interesting from the perspective of social roles and how Mozart bakes that into the fabric of this aria. <laughs> That's just the opening, the very opening of the A section to this cavatina. Now, we might have expected Figaro, having just found out of the Count's plot, to be full of rage and anger, and indeed he is. But although we may have expected from that an aria that's full of uh, much more naked aggression, perhaps, fast-paced, maybe lots of leaps in the vocal line, and uh, changes in register and quick changes in dynamics to demonstrate that Figaro is indeed worked up. But that's not what we get at all. Instead, the, uh, Mozart is a little more witty about things, as Figaro himself is a little more controlled in his anger. So instead of a rage aria, let's say, we get instead a very quaint minuet. Now, why is the minuet interesting? The minuet is a dance form, so this is something that would have served as entertainment for much of Mozart's audience. And not only is it a dance form that would have been well known, but it is characteristically a dance of the upper classes. So it's very interesting that Figaro, the lower class servant character, is conscripting the dance of the nobles in order to call out a nobleman. So what he's saying is, I can meet you on your turf, I can meet you on equal footing, I am ready to play this game. You don't know who you're messing with, essentially. It's much more effective to use the minuet than it would have been to use, say, a lower class dance such as a gigue or something like that. It wouldn't have had the same effect. But to take this noble stately dance and to use it as part of his sort of martial urgings, Figaro is showing us his own ability to manipulate music in order to serve his own ends. That's actually why when he sings the Les uh, Signorosi at the very, uh, towards the end, Il Signorosi, di do 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 bum, di 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 di. Those high Fs leap out for a lot of reasons. First, they're high in Figaro's register, in Figaro's voice, but unlike your typical minuet, which uh, lands on the downbeat, if you look at the passage ahead of you uh, in, below, Bum 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 ba da dum bum 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 ba da dum bum 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 bum. It's discharging, emphasizing the downbeat, the first beat of the measure. But when Figaro sings C, he in fact sings loudly and high on the second of the second beat of the measure. That sort of throws the the rhythm of the minuet off kilter, and indeed is showing him uh, that he is throwing the count off kilter as well. Welcome to my dancing school. Now I'm gonna emphasize beat two and throw you off balance when you least expect it. It's a sort of clever musical manipulation on Mozart and Figaro's part to signify to the audience the exact sort of character that Figaro is. So it's a perfect sort of match for expressing, for expressing the character. Now, beyond that, uh, Figaro also, declines to sing a typical da capo aria, again, that we might expect from a more serious rage-filled aria. So a da capo aria would be an opening A section that then sets a contrasting B section and then returns to confirm the A section with added embellishments. Figaro doesn't give us that. Instead, after a brief transition, his rage starts to bubble up and then he restrains himself and then he lets us know what comes next in his battle with the count.
So it's jokes within jokes. Try to deceive me and I'll beat you to it. So rather than that expected musical structure, Mozart instead leaps into a presto 2-4 two, four, uh, two, four time signature, something much more quick and upbeat. Figaro dancing around the stage, but this time uh, rather as a fencer than as a noble, noble dancer of the minuet. And so what he does here is he throws the audience's ear off as Figaro is throwing the count off. It's all built in to keep us off kilter. Again, the effect is have by putting that into the mouth of a character is to characterize that person. That makes us feel that Figaro is in control of this particular musical texture, letting us know that he is going to be up to the task of challenging the count, which is exactly what we see moving forward throughout the rest of the opera. That is going to conclude our uh, discussion of Figaro as a, as a character. He is a, he is a character that I'll just say in closing that draws the lines between the classes very distinctly and that's primarily through the music that Mozart writes for him. It's no mistake that we have, as I mentioned, a, a minuet as opposed to any other dance. This was done knowingly and with real purpose and it has a real effect on how we perceive the opera today and how we perceive uh, this opera in relation to social critique and political satire. But let's now pivot and talk about the Countess, a Seria character. We're going to first look at her opening scene. In fact, because of all of the craziness that goes on in Act One of this opera, we do not actually meet the Countess until the opening of Act Two. It is a withholding of character that has an incredible effect on the audience because, like Figaro in this scene, it is only uh, the second time in which we see a character completely alone on stage in the opera. And so, Along with that isolation, what is it about the rest of the scene and the music that helps add to that sense of loneliness and isolation? Let's have a listen. It's notable that we catch the Countess in her entrance singing. She is not introduced to us as a character interacting with others in recitative, but indeed is given us uh, an aria of affect in which she sings all by her lonesome self. She stares out the window as the scene opens, and we see her standing in a broad, magnificent chamber, uh, again, all by herself. The first thing that we notice with this introduction of a new character is perhaps that we are also going to hear a new instrument. This is the beginning of Act Two, and this is also the beginning of clarinets in this opera. So we're getting not only a new character 
but also, again, a new instrumental timbre that has something to tell us about uh, characterizing this particular, this particular person. This is the first also combination of two bassoons, two horns, and two clarinets in, in the opera as well. This sort of added element of the winds adds an element of pathos and, uh, and sort of poignancy to the moment that we are missing in the opera until this point. Now, the textures of this entire aria are very simple. They're restrained. And all of that simplicity leads to that interpretation of the stark loneliness of the Countess. Now, the Countess is, in fact, a very serious character. She is a character cut straight from the cloth of opera seria. Now, this is not just incidental. In fact, it was by design on the part of Mozart. As he wrote in that same letter to his father that I mentioned in lecture one, he's talking about what he needs in this story, and he writes, the most essential thing is that, on the whole, the story should be really comic, which he got. And, if possible, he ought to introduce two equally good female parts, one of these to be Seria, the other mezzo carattere, but both parts equal in importance and excellence. The third female character, however, may be entirely buffa, and so may all the male ones, if necessary. This is such an insightful line that Mozart writes. We do, in fact, get an incredibly comic opera. And we do, in fact, get two equally good female parts in the Countess and in Susanna, the mezzo carattere, to whom he refers. So what is this Seria character? Well, the Seria character that Mozart's uh, audiences may have expected would have been more given to sort of uh, vocal pyrotechnics. That is someone who was very virtuosic, who received all of the biggest arias, who was able to sing very high and often uh, very floridly. We would see a lot of melismas in their writing. And usually in a lot of these characters, their acting ability was somewhat secondary to their singing ability. This is absolutely not the case with the introduction of the Countess. Mozart plays on our expectations to give us something else. And in doing so, he strikes at the core of drawing a Countess that we see as such a human figure today. So we notice in the clip that we heard, everything was very restrained. There was a long drawn out introduction that really sets the scene for us. Not much is happening. There's just a sort of constant pulsation uh, in the different instrumental parts. Uh, this 16th note motive, bum, ba, da, da, ba, da, da, that we hear over and over in the introduction. And when the Countess finally begins to sing, it is with restraint rather than excess. We do not see any melismas. In fact, she sings mostly syllabically and flows, fits very nicely within the rhythm that has been established for her by the orchestra in that long prelude. And so what Mozart is doing here is taking a character, taking the seriousness of this character and giving it a sort of poignancy that we may have missed if it had been written by some other composer. And in so doing, we're, we're given a character who we can begin to feel some real sympathy for. It's not actually about her voice, it's about her plight. It's about the lost love, the stagnating love between her and her husband. And by stripping away the music and uh, the vocal line to those sorts of bare essentials, Mozart enables the individual, uh, that interpretation to sort of shine through. Uh, the Countess must have an excellent voice in order to sing this well but we are not drawn so much to the abilities of her voice as we are drawn to the character and, uh, and her sadness, ultimately. Now, we mentioned as well, both parts being equal in importance and excellence. And that brings us to an interesting uh, relationship between the classes. So we noticed in Figaro's aria that his relationship with the upper class is one that is characterized by antagonism. Obviously, the count plotting to get his beloved Susanna is someone who needs to be confronted. And in this sense, Figaro serves as the mouthpiece of the lower classes in critiquing the upper classes, as we saw in Sevol Barare. Now what's interesting is that if the men are at loggerheads constantly throughout this opera, the women of the opera are much more often able to form uh, genuine, genuine bonds of friendship that tend to shine through despite the divisions of class. And we see that at the very beginning. So 
after the countess's uh, after the countess's opening aria, we'll call it. We see her engaging with Suzanne. At the very end there, we see the Countess put her arm around Susanna, and it's this sort of closeness that typifies uh, the relationship between the women in this opera. If we think back to Act One, when the Count comes into the chambers, it's very much an invasion, a man invading this domestic space of Figaro and Susanna. It's a real problem. However, in this interior space, the Countess's chambers, we see a sort of welcoming, inviting warmth. Carabino enters the space, Susanna and the Countess here, um, outside of the pressures of public life, are able to let their guard down, so to speak, and approach something uh, resembling a genuine relationship in spite of their very obvious social differences. This is one of the key points in discussing class in this opera. We tend to focus on the, so the social public political side as characterized especially by figures like, uh, like Figaro and the Count. But indeed, much of the power of this opera and why it remains so memorable today is in the formation of these genuine friendships between the characters. And if there is a lesson to be taught, it is not the lesson of Figaro uh, and the Count regarding, uh, regarding social critiques and classes. Indeed, it has a message to impart more about the power of friendship that can be formed uh, by Susanna and the Count, as illustrated by Susanna and the Countess. So with that, we'll conclude our brief, uh, our brief excursion into the characterization of just two of these characters. We could spend multiple lectures delving into each of these characters, but for now, realize that each of the characters is treated with that same level of care and import by Mozart. Each character is considered for their place, for their place within the social spectrum of the opera, and therefore for the type of music that they receive, and the things that they have to say. And so as you go through this opera, try to take notice of where these uh, characters fit into that economy and how the things they say may reflect something not just of the sort of economy of uh, class and gender as it involves in the opera, but also what it may say about uh, society on a broader level. So in the next lecture, we're going to delve into the Act Two finale. Thank you for watching this second video lecture of the Princeton Festival's Le Nazi di Figaro series, and I hope you enjoyed. Bye-bye.